Welcome to our online audience. Now that you can see everything the right way, I hope. All right. So I welcome everyone here. Glad to have you. It's our final Sunday here at St. Stephen's. We are making a move next week to Sacred Heart. And so uh, we are excited about that. But it's a little surreal to think this has been five and a half years uh, that we've been here at St. Stephen. Uh, I, think it, I think it's been that. So uh, we're making a change upcoming. It's exciting. And yet we're going to need a lot of grace from you because what we thought would be a one-hour meeting at the school to figure everything out was like a... 18 minute meeting <laughs> and we have a lot of questions so uh, we'll still be figuring, th figuring things out next Sunday the 17th but we wanted to just keep reminding you about that. So there'll be lots of advertising going on our Facebook, our uh, Instagram account, our website. Uh, there's an email that's gone out with the new location and a map to it. Uh, so and we're even going to have this lovely young couple here here next Sunday. We'll sit in the parking lot and in case you arrive here and forget they will redirect you. So uh, we're going to do our best to make sure everyone makes that uh, transition. So would you stand with me? We're going to go ahead and pray this morning and then uh, we'll jump into worship together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness over uh, five and a half years of launching together and growing together uh, in this space. We pray a blessing on this school, the principals, the, st uh, the principal rather, the teachers, the students, and that you, your name, Jesus, would be lifted high on this property continually uh, throughout this uh, neighborhood and that you would bless uh, the students here. Keep them safe. Draw them to yourself, we pray. Um, and even as we leave and go to another location, we pray your continued blessing here. And today, God, we, we've come to worship you, to learn from you, to lift our hearts to you. And so we want to do that this morning. And thank you that your presence is here with us again to greet us and to, um, to lead us deeper in a walk and relationship with you. So we pray your blessing throughout this day. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's worship together.
and Father, this morning as we come to you, we thank you that we're able to come to you. It's because of the cross and what Jesus has provided for us. And as we just even sung about this morning, the way of salvation has been provided by you, Jesus. That you came, you died, you beat death in the grave, and you are coming again. And we have all things, people, we have something to celebrate and be joyful about. And so uh, we declare it, God, that we're grateful for your salvation and we need you more today than we did yesterday. So, Lord, whether it's for a physical need today, whether it's a job or um, maybe a family member who's away from you, wherever that need might be uh, sort of aching in our heart today, we lift that to you. Just in this moment, we ask you, God, to minister to the needs that are heavy on our heart. Your word says that if we are burdened and heavy laden, we can come to you and you will give us rest. And not only that, you are a God who answers our prayers. You intercede for us. And you bring answers. And so we are so grateful today for that. We lift these needs to you. And we ask God that as we raise them to you, you would minister to them. As big as they might be to us. For you, uh, they are, they're small in your eyes. And you are able to touch them. And so we surrender them to you. And we confess our need for you today. We do it in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, why don't you say hi to neighbors one last time at this location anyway. <laughs> say hi and a handshake or a high five. Bless you as you do that this morning. God bless you. Hello. Hopefully this is working out. Okay, I see some people saying hi there. Hey, everybody. Glad that you're uh, online. We had a little bit of technical difficulties in here this morning. It was my fault. So sorry to our online crew for that. Amen. Well, everybody, good morning. Glad to have you with us, family. Glad that you're uh, able to make it here today. Um, you know, my truck finds its way here every Sunday for the last five and a half years fairly easily. Uh, it just sort of knows all the turns and leads me right here. But uh, it's going to be a shift uh, next week. And so um, we're going to be telling you a little bit more about that. Of course, it will be on all of our social media. But a couple other announcements. Kim Singh is coming up September 24th at 2. So if you'd like to be a part of that, you can talk to the Watsons. You can talk to the Fortunes. Um, but on the uh, 24th, uh, that's two Sundays from now. Uh, they are at 2 o'clock at the uh, Bridalwood Seniors Home, Retirement Home. There's a hymn sing that takes place there, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. There's more information. Probably if you ask uh, a neighbor here, they'll be able to direct you to uh, further information about that. It's a great time. Man, we have a new location for our study. How about this? The D'Souza's home, I had to do a bit of arm twisting, uh, but no, I did, we didn't. Uh, they have such a big heart of hospitality, so Peter and Huguette have opened their home for us men. So Wednesday, September 20th, that's not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, uh, our men are going to be meeting at 6.45. Come at 6.45, uh, the coffee will be on. Peter's responsible for the sweets as well, so it should be good. Love you, Peter. Uh, he's, what? Uh, no, we'll, they're going to look after the coffee, but men, as we usually do, we'll have a little schedule for um, sweets, and you can sign up for that. Uh, but they have a beautiful home there, and we're going to continue with our, our study that we've been watching by uh, J. Warner Wallace uh, on Cold Case Christianity and sharing our faith. Uh, we have, I think, about four videos left in that series, and then we'll move on from there. But love for you to come. Share that with uh, some other friends and come. There's, uh, you know... Get there early enough to get the best seat in the house. Nice big couch right here. Some good space there. Yeah. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I encourage you to be a part of that. Some ways you can be involved this morning. Uh, as we are moving to our new location. And we're really believing for some growth and young families in that area. It's, it's a much more visible area. And, and uh, it's next to the, uh, is it called the Cardell Rec Center? I guess it is there. Or the Goulburn one. Uh, the pool, the soccer fields, the baseball fields are all right there. And uh, many people are going to be going past there, of course, on Sunday. And we want to really grow all of our ministries. So Proximity Kids, Marsha's been leading that for the past five years. Annie's coming on. The two of them are going to do an amazing job with our kids' ministries. So that's what we need you. We need your help. Okay, so I think Marsha's taking nursery and the little ones. Uh, Annie's going to take on the kids. But we need a lot more help with that. So uh, please make sure to sign up for that. Now, we were hoping really on the 17th to launch, like the woohoo, but our <laughs> classrooms weren't fully confirmed yet. Um, and we're still working on volunteers and training. So on the 17th, there'll be some registration that is going to take place. So you're going to be able to come and see Marsha and Annie there. Register uh, your kids, either for nursery or kids or whatever area they're in. They'll give you a lot more information. As a matter of fact, we need volunteers. So you can see these ladies today at the back table. Sign up. Ask or let them know which area you'd like to be involved in, and uh, they'll help you up with that. Um, and then also, so next Sunday, there may be like a little... Um, um, 
sort of in their seats thing for the kids to do, and we'll involve them that way. But I am hearing that there'll be Tim Horton's coffee and Tim Bits next Sunday after the service. So just throwing that out there. Uh, another little draw, you know, to, you know, it's funny when we met with the vice principal um, and we were asking a bunch of questions in our little 20 minute window, one of the things he suggested, he says, he says, you know, one of the things, pyrotechnics, are you using pyrotechnics? That could be a real draw. And I thought, you know, that's basically fireworks and smoke machines. And I thought, I don't know, should I be trusted around that? I don't think so. So. Uh, security, we shut that down. That's the next one. We do need some security. We need some ushering help. We need all of that. Uh, this uh, building is much larger. 2,300 students. Uh, they won't be there that week, but they're uh, that Sunday. But there's a lot of other people moving in and out of the building. So we need ushers. We'll need uh, um, help with security and just transporting the kids to their class, making sure they're safe. All of that. So please, uh, and that's also our setup team. So we didn't think we'd need set up, but as we look at that building and what's needed, we may need for the, at least the first month some, some set up and then beyond that. So we will still have set up teams and um, come early and uh, be a part of that. That would be so helpful. Then our welcome team, again, because we have uh, one door uh, off the, uh, um, what would that be? That would be the east side of the building, I guess it is the east side of the building. You come in that main, not the main parking lot, but the other side. There's a side door that I guess they use, and there's a front door that may be open, but we will need welcome and greeters at those areas as well as at the main auditorium. So all of this to say, we need your help. <laughs> we're gonna need your help because um, we're, as a family, we're hosting the community, all right? So all of us are, are creating a space for people to come and meet Jesus, that's our part. So somewhere in here, we'd love for you to uh, find a place to come and help. There's certainly the prayer team, Deb leads our prayer team, and you can jump on with that, as well in other areas. Uh, sound could also use some people, so please consider helping in some of those areas. Um, this website is gonna have up the picture of the school in our new location and some links, uh, probably tomorrow or by Tuesday, And but also you know you can donate there and find out lots more about proximity. So that slide, I'm sure you're really used to. And here is a picture of the school that we're at, Sacred Heart. So from here, just to give you an idea, if you were to sort of follow this main street out of the school through the lights and you go Main Street, Smithville, eventually you're going to hit Abbott. I think it's about two, three lights down. You're going to go left and right down there is the, uh, the Sacred Heart at Catholic High School. One warning, okay? And I've been caught already with this. There is a speed trap camera by Sacred Heart. <laughs> I may have gotten a ticket already there, all right? It was in the past, it's been forgiven and paid, but uh, just be careful, that's a school zone, and even though it's a Sunday, that little machine doesn't care. There's no grace with that machine, it will just send you a ticket in the mail. So be careful through that school zone area, And uh, but we'd love to see you next Sunday here, September 17th. So there's all of our announcements. Uh, if there's anything I've missed, please see some of our team or talk to me afterwards. If you have some questions, we do our best to uh, try and answer those for you. Any of our board could uh, help with that uh, as well. So we're on, uh, this is number two in our series on prodigal paths. And we're looking at the uh, biblical story here, the parable of the prodigal son. And Jesus kind of shares this in a way because he's been accused by the Pharisees of welcoming sinners and this is what we're going to be doing right we're well, well we all are and now have been saved and set free by god's grace but we want to welcome other people to come and find that same grace so uh, he tells this story and we're going to go back through it so some recap first all right just to kind of get you up to speed on where we were last sunday if you missed that video uh, or the sunday the word prodigal is an interesting word if you've been in the church for a number of years you might see prodigal and think well doesn't that mean um, sort of this raggedy guy who finds his way home, but he's kind of blown everything. Yeah, it, it can mean that, that, but the word actually can mean spending money or resources recklessly, wastefully, or extravagantly. And then look at number two, having or giving something on a lavish scale. So you may even see in some sermon titles, they'll say a prodigal God, because our God gives lavishly, graciously. But we've assigned to this word prodigal just only the, the reckless, wanton, kind of useless part of it. And so it's an interesting word when we look at this, that, that it almost has two pieces to it. It can be generous, it can be wasteful. It can be extravagant or lavish, you see that? It, it, it can have a little bit of both pieces to it. And so it's kind of this interesting word, and we're looking at the story to kind of pull apart uh, the pieces. 
Now, we read Luke 15 last week. We're going to be in the last part of it, but I'm going to, I'm going to read the whole parable again for you in case, again, you weren't here. So we're going to, we'll read right through, and then uh, we're going to be looking at the older son this week. So the older sibling uh, in, in, in the story, all right? Luke 15, Jesus tells the story. He says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. When he spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. Now, it's not here, but as Jesus was telling this story to Jewish hearers, you probably would have heard an audible, <gasps> this was like, this was just a total faux pas, that this would not happen. A Jewish boy would go somewhere and feed pigs. It's just the lowest possible uh, uh, part of the story. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that pigs ate but no one gave him anything. And when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise, go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he has this practiced statement he's going to be sharing. He arose and he came to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son, uh, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So last Sunday, this was our text. We, um, I think we read all the way through. But we sort of focused in on just the younger son. And we uh, looked at five different uh, stages of the, uh, the process here for him. And we looked at this son who was lost and came back. And uh, the young prodigal son as we know it. But today, we're going to uh, keep going. And we're going to look at the older son. So here I have the, uh, sorry, let me back up a minute. The two sons. And I've decided this guy's younger because he had the cooler haircut. Uh, at least in my estimation, it seems to be. But I could be wrong on that. I'm not a trendsetter, at least not known to be. But we're going to focus on the older son, all right? So now we've got the older son. It says, now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. And he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened cow, because he has received him back safe and sound. But look at this, he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And then it wraps up here. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. We look at the story of prodigal paths. I think in this story specifically, we can see ourselves in these three different roles in some manner. Now, certainly many of us can relate last week to the prodigal son. We have, the word of God says we've all wandered and gone our own way and lost our way and he has come and rescued us and we relate really clearly to the prodigal, the traditional prodigal son, the younger son. But when we look at the story, it's amazing how we can forget that quite possibly, and I've heard this preached this way and I've preached probably this this way as well, the older son is just as much a prodigal in many ways. He has not understood what was his through the father and so there are different paths and this is the way we've looked at this, uh, this uh, parable. That Proverbs talks about, do not enter the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. And then down here in verse 18 it says, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. We have many paths, but these are two paths, at least in Proverbs, 
that we are encouraged to avoid the path of the wicked and to look for the, the path here of the righteous, that day by day it gets brighter. More and more revelation from God, more and more we understand His loving kindness, His grace to us, right? It gets brighter and brighter, and we want to walk on that path. We want to be those who will uh, surrender our lives to His, um, His will. So, um, just again, all this is a little bit preliminary, but you'll, you'll see where it takes us. The young son we've talked about, we're talking about this guy in yellow, okay, the older son. I've given him a tractor. <laughs> I know he probably didn't have one, but I thought he deserved a tractor. So I give him a tractor, a wheelbarrow. He's got a shovel uh, that doesn't extend to his backhand. Sorry about that. I just realized that. Um, but here he is, the older son, all right? He's been home, and today we're going to look at him. Last week was the younger who went off to the city. I know there's an airplane there, and they probably didn't have one, but it seemed fun. So we're going to spend some time here. Who is this older son? How can we relate to this older son? How can we learn maybe some lessons about what, how we should behave? Um, and you might remember this little snippet, too, of the younger son's uh, sort of, he didn't say this in the Bible, but I'm kind of taking a little bit of liberty here. You know, I can just imagine the two of them sitting there and him maybe one day before he ever asked his dad, you know, do you ever wish dad was gone so we could have his money? Because essentially when the younger son said to his dad, I kind of want what's coming to me. That was, in, in that culture, it was effectively him saying, I kind of wish you were dead and I could just have the money. That was kind of what he was saying. And the older son, I kind of surmised that he would say, did he just say that out loud? <laughs> I might have thought that, but I'm not so young and silly to have said that out loud. And then I kind of added one this week uh, to that. But actually, if I'm honest, I kind of was just like his money. And I'm saying that because as we look at these two sons, we see that they're, at least initially, they both sort of have a similar um, attitude towards dad. And that comes out in the story. We see that they both seem to have this attitude, uh, and that gets revealed. And these were the five points, but the one we're going to focus on that's different uh, in our story this week will be the process. See, last week, the prodigal had a path, he had plans, he experienced pain. In his process, though, he came back to the Father, right? He asked for forgiveness. He said, I've failed. Father, I've, I've hurt you in heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. He had a moment of repentance and returning back to God. And it's something we celebrate as a church. We say that's necessary. And he makes this, he goes through this process of repentance and this petition to the Father of being received. It's a beautiful picture of what he went through. But what you're going to find today is that when we get to the process, as we're going to with the older son here, the process leads to a different place. And that's where I want to focus this morning. That's what I want you to see. That the older son has an issue that comes up. And he realizes it in the moment that he's confronted with the younger son coming home. So let's look at his life. Same, same uh, five points, but a different version of that with the older son. First thing we see is his path. He is the older son, and I'm just going to highlight this. He was in the field. He is faithful. In that sense, he was in the field. He didn't go to dad. He didn't ask for his inheritance. He was there, work day in, day out, calluses on his hands, all the rest. He was in the field doing the job. No matter how much it stunk, no matter how bad it got, he was there. Even if it meant disposing of skunks, he was there. He was in the field. And I bring that up because this week we had, this past week, we had a skunk that was been in our yard last uh, for the last week, digging up the yard, trying to be a rotor to learn. I was not happy about that. And so I prepared a little home for him uh, and wrapped it in blue tarp and kind of put a little peanut butter sandwich in there for him. You think, well, that's so nice of you, Pastor Jake. It is, isn't it? So I put that in my yard and I've been watching it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then finally, uh, you know, as uh, Ryan was leaving our house one night, he goes, tell your dad, I think he's caught the stump. And sure enough, you know, it was midnight, I think, probably. And uh, next morning I go up, and there he is asleep in his new little home, and I start the truck and pick him up, and I'm going to take him for a free vacation, so I brought him over to the back of the truck and set him in, no spray, I was very nervous to be honest, <laughs> Lord please don't let me get sprayed, this is, you know, I'm just going to shut the truck nicely, talk nicely to him, got in, drove him to his new home of the country, not near my house, and uh, kind of aimed him towards, just kind of aimed the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the trap off a certain way, and I had a nice long string. I watched some videos. I had a nice long string, <laughs> and I attached it to the gate, and I stood kind of behind the tailgate, and I just kind of, Lord, please have him go somewhere else, you know, and I just kind of pulled it up, and like a bolt, he was gone. No spray, no stink. But I kind of thought, man, the farmers who have to deal with this day in, day out, and even worse than this with pigs or cows and all the different rodents that find their way in, that's not an easy job. 
Look at it. He's, his path, he's faithful. He's in the field. It's not a glamorous job. He's there day in, day out. It says he was in the field. He was doing what the father needed him to do. And then this happens. Your brother, he gets the answer about all the music. Your brother has come home. Your father has killed the fat calf because he has received him back safe and sound. There's this moment on his path where he's thinking, I'm faithful. That other brother's gone. Now, I know it's a story, an illustration, but we're treating it as though it's, it's real in that sense. And and he hears this news. And this is where something begins to happen in his heart. As faithful as he was in the story, something happens when he hears about this brother who is gone, who's now back, that reveals his heart. As faithful as he was being in the field. And you can just imagine, you know, <laughs> so I'm back. <laughs> Any of you who are the older sibling right now, there's probably some things creeping up in you, you know, like, oh, they got away with everything. I never got back. You know, that never happened for us. Um, and, it, and it's funny to think about some of those things that happened over the years. And we as a family, we were, um, we had uh, just, I think it was Thanksgiving or a dinner together. And on, um, uh, so Roy and Faye are there, David, Heather's older brother's there, Heather's there. And they're reminiscing about times, you know, when they were growing up at high school. And because Roy taught an arm prior, you know, he would drive the kids back and forth. And uh, then David left home, then Mary Beth left home. And it was just Heather. She was the baby in the family. And so they would, you know, Roy and Heather would drive to school, and on the way home, we would often stop at Dairy Queen. And so Heather was just reminiscing and saying, Dad, remember those days where we would drive and school was over, and you'd take me to Dairy Queen? And David, who's the older brother, said, What? Never! Never! Right? But you know, with three kids, it's a little more expensive at Dairy Queen, but when you're the baby, right? It's different. I'm going to get in trouble later. I'm never going to Dairy Queen again now, but... But you can imagine, right, this, 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 this tension between older and younger, that if I didn't get it, you don't get it. How dare you? You know, like, do mm, you see what I went through to provide that for you? There's got to be this tension. There's this reaction to the good news that comes up in the older son's heart. And we see in Romans 12, uh, the scripture talks this way. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful, patient, faithful in prayer. Serve the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Look at all these things are so beautiful. Bless those who curse to you. Bless and do not curse. Look at verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. We are commanded in the word of God, no matter how we might feel about a situation, we might feel we were wronged or we missed out in some way, the word of God says to us, we are to rejoice with those who rejoice, to celebrate, mourn with those who mourn. We are to take on this, this heart and this passion of joy when we hear something like this. But we know in the story, that's not, even though the brother was in the field and he was being faithful, there was something in his heart, wasn't there? There was something that was off because the moment he hears about a brother who's come home, he's not so joyful. He's not so happy, even though he chose a good path. John 21 says it this way, and you might remember the story. Remember when Peter, this is after uh, Jesus has um, died on the cross, came back, appeared to the disciples, and now he's, uh, he's corrected Peter, he's restored Peter. Uh, he said, feed my sheep, Peter, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep, that whole piece. And now when we get to verse 20, Peter turns and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, who's writing this, <laughs> is following them. And look at verse 21. Peter says, he saw him and he says, Lord, what about him? We all can find ourselves. Well, Lord, I know you're asking me to do this. And I, I, you know, neglected and, and said I didn't know you three times. And you've restored me now. But he's kind of feeling a little sore about that. And he looks and sees John. And he goes, what about him? Let's talk about what's wrong in his life. And I love Jesus' answer. He says, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? And this, is, this piece is so important. He says, you must follow me. Essentially what he's saying is, Peter, you do you. Is that the way it is, Naomi? Is that right? I don't know. It's probably not. That's not so cool. Sorry, erase that from the tape. Uh, you know. But you be you. You do you. Don't, let you, you don't, don't worry about everyone else and what everyone else is doing. You be faithful to what you've been called to do. And this older brother, we're going to see in the story, that's, that's really what Jesus is kind of saying to him. You be faithful to what you're called to do and rejoice. Your brother's home. What's going on here? He chose a faithful path, but he's missing the point of these things. And we see it when the plan comes out. Because the plan, his plan of being faithful in the field doesn't work. So it says he was angry and refused to go in. 
There's a party, there's dancing, there's celebration. He's so upset, he's not going to go in, he's not going to go celebrate. I'm not going to be part of this. And he even says here, these many years I have served, and I have never disobeyed your command. I've never, ever made a misstep. You see how he was putting everything, his plans were all about, I'm going to be so faithful, I'm going to do it all. You know, that becomes our own righteousness, doesn't it? I mean, I attended church, I showed up here, I was always there, I was always serving, I've got a big Bible, even the right translation of the Bible, right, God? Because King James is the only one, whatever it might be, you know, like, I've got, I'm doing it all right, I never took a misstep. This is the attitude, and it becomes what? Pride. Pride that's being confronted here. Now, remember, Jesus is telling the story, because he's being accused of dealing with sinners, and the Jewish people don't like this, the Pharisees don't like it, and so the older brother in the story, if you follow the context, he's now addressing them as the older brother, essentially. He's saying, you think you're all okay, you've been in the field, and you keep all the commandments, and you're righteous, and you do all, everything a certain way. He's kind of now kind of edging in on them, but they, they maybe don't catch on quite the way. They, they think, oh, I've never disobeyed your command. I've always kept things right. I'll tell you how personal this is for me. A week ago, when I was driving in at uh, Sunday morning and going to preach that first series, I had thought about a couple of ministry friends of mine who have, are no longer in ministry and I don't think any longer serving the Lord and I don't know where they're at. They're certainly in a prodigal state as the younger son in that sense. And I just felt to pray for them. So I was driving in and I was kind of almost like happy of myself that I was like, look at me, I'm praying for these guys who are prodigals. And I began to just kind of pray. And I, mean, I, I, I was really being sincere. And then this thought crossed my mind. What if God all of a sudden brought that person back and restored them? And their ministry grew beyond my ministry. And you know what happened? Right away my heart went, oh, that wouldn't be fair, God. And you know what I started to think? I've been faithful. I've been in this school, unpacking, dealing with Peter D'Souza. I'm sorry, Peter, I just had to throw one more in. You know, I've been faithful. I've been here. I've been in the I've never disobeyed. Well, you know, like, Lord, that wouldn't be. And I thought, oh, wow, even my heart. All of us can find ourselves here where we start to think, I've been doing the right things. I've never disobeyed. I've always followed through. And we can believe something that's not true because the Word of God says we've all, we've all sinned, right? We've all missed it. This week, I'm going to have a couple of those failings. You're going to have some of those failings. That's what's going to happen. But the reality is that Mark 10 talks about this. It talks about um, the rich young ruler who comes, who had the same idea. Remember that? It says he was, as he was setting out on a journey, a man went up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, he's this rich young ruler approaching Jesus. What shall I do that I might get eternal life? And Jesus said to him, him and said to him, one, uh, one thing you lack, go and sell your possession, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. You see, what the rich young ruler had was he had the rules, he had the stuff, he had the money, he had all that figured out, but he didn't have the relationship with the Father. He didn't have the relationship with the Father. He wasn't willing. Something else had his heart. His stuff had his heart. His plans were, and, the, and, and for the prodigal son, the older prodigal son now, that I'm going to inherit this farm. I'm looking after this farm because one day it's mine. Whatever about that. And so... We can find ourselves in the same place sometimes. We can find ourselves, in 1 John says it this way, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know we are children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Two things, loving God and carrying out his commands. If you love God, you will carry out his commands. Others of us think, well, I better carry out his commands. <laughs> then he'll believe I love him. No, no, if you love God, you will carry out his commands. And then the word of God, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. And that's not burdensome. Think of it this way. You love your, your, your wife or your friends or your children. And you know, hopefully, <laughs> the reality is that you love them and you do things for them because you love them. You don't go, oh, they're going to want this, so I better provide it so they think I love them. No, that's not. What kind of relationship is that, really? We want to do things for people because we love them. And then it's not a heavy thing. It's, it's a beautiful thing. That's what the Scripture's saying. That's where we want our heart to be. That's the posture of our heart where we want to be. But that's not where the older son's heart was. His plan and, and his path here was a, was a wrong path for him. And it ultimately brought out the pain. Now we see his pain. We had saw the younger brother's pain. Remember that he was lost and hurting and without his family and realized that came to himself. But here the older brother's pain is this. He says, he accuses God, you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. 
and when the son of yours. <laughs> I will admit, I've used that phrasing with my kids. Your son. Do you know what your daughter did today? No, never. It was never your daughter. Damn it, sorry. Always your son. Sorry, Andrew. You know. <laughs> but we will say your son, you know, because we want to we want to remove ourselves, right? And be like, well, and that's essentially what we see in the story. You never gave me anything. And when the son of yours, not my brother, he doesn't say my brother there. I'm going to exclude myself from this guy. This son of yours, you can, you can have this whole situation. I don't want anything, any part of it. That's essentially, he's, he's had so much pain here, he even believes that the father never gave him anything. And look what he even accuses the brother. He's devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fat calf for him. It's an exclamation mark there. You did it for him. Every family would keep, uh, or wealthy families would keep a fattened calf, that calf, Basically, they fed that thing waiting that one day when Thanksgiving or a party came, that was the calf we were having. That was the best steaks. That was all of it was right there. Well, the father in the story kills the fattened calf for this son who wasted everything. And, and we hear the pain. We hear the pain. And some of us who come into the church and sometimes we hear the story of someone, and, and, and maybe you felt yourself there too, we hear the story of someone God's redeemed and we can feel a bit of pain and think, wow, why has God blessed them so much? I don't feel like he gave me that. He never did that in my life. We can forget it, right? He never even gave me a goat. He, for sure he did. And much more than that. But we forget. James reminds us in James 1. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Look at this. Every good and perfect gift is from above. God is a loving God. He gives the sun and the rain. We all experience this amazing love of God, this amazing grace of God, and his patience even now with a world that is, doesn't, for the most part, doesn't want anything to do with him. He continues to love, continues to make the sun shine, continues to every single day call people to himself. That's the love of the Father. Gives us oxygen to breathe. Gives family and health and another day to celebrate his goodness. All of that, James says, it's all from the Father, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. So this, this older son doesn't even get it right, but the, everything the Father has is his. We see that later. It's all his. It's all, he, he has access to all of it, but he doesn't understand the heart of the Father. He misses the whole piece of the Father. Romans it says it this way, just to add to this a little bit, it says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Look at this, since, once they know, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Look at so that people are without excuse. God has made himself known to this world through creation. You see the leaves changing, the sunsets that we've had this past week, the beauty of the creation that we have around us. Watch a little one be born. Hold them in your arms. I mean, my whole phone right now is just full of little pictures of baby heads and mustangs. That's it. If you go through my phone, it's one baby or another. It's either a red mustang or a little baby green. It's one or the other, you know, and... And, 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 and when I look at this, I think, God, you love this world. You've made, you've revealed yourself in the design that is so intricate around this world. It's a powerful picture here. And that we can find ourselves sometimes thinking, well, God, you did so much for them. You're doing so much for that person in the church or that person over there. But what have you done for me lately? Ah, oh, folks, we've got to watch our heart. We've got to watch that it isn't hardened like this, this sun. And so finally, when we get to the process, and this is the one where it is so key. So with the younger brother, we understand the process led to repentance. But in this story, the process doesn't lead to repentance for the older son. It says, when the son of yours came who has devoured your property to the prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Remember that part? When the son came, it was for him that you did it. It was for him. It's all about him. And he's saying, I'm not, I don't want any part to do with this. The process, he's thinking about, you, that's great, you're, you're gracious to him, but you've never been gracious to me. Your grace is only for others, never for me. He doesn't get the heart of the Father. And I thought maybe the best way to kind of look at this is that the path, the plans, and the pain have all been the same. But when all of us get to the place of process, we either are going to hear me today, we're either going to say, yes to Jesus, I surrender, you are right, I have sinned, please forgive me. And we're going to be like a younger son. Or we're going to be like this older son who says, you've extended grace to everyone else, but never gave me anything. And no repentance. 
And that's the story. Essentially, and Jesus is telling the Jewish people who are listening to Pharisees, are you going to be like that? Are you going to be the older son who won't come and be received back in? And that's the picture that we see. We see an accusation that the father is unfair and an unforgiveness that there's a lack of mercy. It's almost like the speck in the plank. Remember that story in the Bible? Uh, you look at what he's done, what he's done, what he's done. You've got a plank in your eye, but you can only see the speck in someone else's eye. And this is where this, this older brother is living. He's working the field, but he's missing the very point of the work in the heart of the father. And this can be where we are at if we look at the church and the kingdom work as what we can get out of it rather than we, we can contribute to it. When we start to think, God, look what I've done for you and how many years I've served for you and what I've done and I'm doing all this work for you. We're missing the heart of the Father. Instead, it should be, God, thank you again for another day to preach and get together with some amazing people and we get to go to a new building next week and who knows what's in store there. Thank you for that. Keep me going. Keep me, please keep feeding me with what you want to share. It's a different heart. It's a heart that understands the Father's love and His grace. And so the petition never comes. I've highlighted it here. There's no petition moment for the older son. There's no moment of repentance, at least we're not told in the story, that he finally caves and says, you're right, Dad, you know, I got it wrong. There's never that moment, which is the saddest part in this story. Instead, he says to him, the father says, son, you're always with me. All I have is yours. Look at this word. It was fitting to celebrate. This was the right thing to do. It's fitting to celebrate. It's the right thing to celebrate when people come to Jesus. No matter how messed up their life was, my life was just messed up. Sin essentially is sin. It keeps us from God. So he's saying it's fitting. This is, this is a good thing for people to come. It's funny how over the years sometimes we've been praying, uh, I've been praying for people uh, and with people for people who are lost. And I remember in one church we were praying for this different family and they came to the church, they finally came to the church and we had a bit of an outreach and this family showed up and the very family that was related to them and praying for them was suspect of them going, I don't know, I think they're just here for the pizza. And I'm like, what is going on here? You know, like, I don't know if this is sincere. And then they kept coming and then I remember baptizing the, the, the older gentleman, baptized him and still people were like, yeah. I'm thinking, this is time to rejoice. This is what it's about. We all, this is time to celebrate. The father gets it, and the father tries to extend it to the son, but he won't hear it. Romans 10 says this way, the word is near you, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart, it's the word of faith that we proclaim, and if you will take the moment to confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from, from the dead, you'll be saved. It's right there. Folks, if you're watching today, it's right there for you to say, Jesus, I need your salvation. It's as simple as that. The Word of God makes it clear. It's as simple as saying, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in you. I, there's nothing of myself. I failed. I've, and even as an older son, I, I thought it was all about work in the field. It's not. It's just about relationship with you. This is what the Father is trying to make clear. Jesus is trying to make clear. And I love this little picture. Sometimes I do better with visuals. So I wanted to show you this in kind of a visual aspect. Last week... We looked at it this way. This was the first son, the younger son, the, the prodigal as we know him. He arose, he came to his father, and while he was looking, still a long way off, his father sees him, feels compassion, runs to him. We're going to look at the father next week. We'll dig into some of this parable around the father, and it's a powerful picture of what all takes place. He runs to him, and he embraces him, and he kisses him. And we get this. The process is that the father comes after the lost. You realize that? That you didn't come to Jesus. He was coming after you. He's called you. He sent his spirit to draw you in to bring conviction. People prayed and God is coming after you and sent his son. John 3, 16, loved you so much. Sent his son, prepared a way. Sent his spirit is calling you, drawing you over and over again. Every single day, that's the work that the father does. He comes after. And when I look at the same story now, let's flip it to the older son we're looking at today. When he was angry and refused to go in, what did the father do? came and entreated him. He still came after that son who was refusing, who was saying, I'm not, no, it's not fair, it's not right. He is the one, God is the one who still comes after us, runs after us. And that word entreated here is a powerful word. It talks about begging, pleading. I try to pull down a little bit of a definition for you from the Greek. Parakaleo. It means, and it comes from the Strong's reference here, to call near, to invite to invoke, look at that, to, to beseech, to comfort, to desire, to, to entreat, to pray. There, this is the heart of God. 
to plead, to beg, to call. Come, come now. As the day is getting late, the time is getting short. Come. Second Peter says it this way in 3. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years like a day. But the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He is wanting everyone. And so he's begging and pleading and, and, and equipping us and sending us to a new location and saying, you know, declare the word of God every Sunday. Worship. Live your lives before me. Why? Because he is entreating this world. Come. Come and find a place at the table. Come and celebrate that goodness. Well, let's kind of wrap it up this morning here with a couple of thoughts. Romans 5, he does all this, and I've highlighted it, I've used it last week, but it's a powerful verse, verse 6. While we were still weak, while we were dead, essentially. Look at verse 8, God shows his love while we were still sinners. This is not something today, if you're watching or if you're here and you're thinking, well, what do I need to do? How can I earn God's favor? How can I, do I need to work in the field or do I need to just, no, he loves you. He's already sent his son to die for you. The price has been paid. It's simply you saying, I accept that. Thank you. I received that, that beautiful gift of yours. Uh, this past week, um, it's amazing that we're already in this season, but as the fall comes in, now that I referee hockey, I got an email saying, you need to come and get recertified as referee. And I thought, oh, okay. I assumed it was an open book test. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have, but I. But the first one was, so I thought, okay, this would be an open book test, and then I got there. No, it's not an open book test, so I was going to be in some trouble. So I thought, I better really focus four hours here. I haven't been in school in a long time, and so, you know, I'm trying to focus, and we're, we're in there, and as I get in the classroom, there's 50 people, 50 guys in there, and of course, they're all too cool to talk to each other. So they've all got their heads down, staring at whatever, and I come in, and I realize there's no seats, and there's no chairs, and four hours, we've got to sit here, and there's... Ten other guys all lined up on the back wall. No one knew what to do. There's no leadership there. And I thought, well, oh, I've got nothing to lose. I just went and started opening closet doors in the room. I thought, got to be some more chairs. I found some chairs. <laughs> all 50 heads are turned to watch me, and I'm just pulling chairs out. I don't work there. I don't know what's going on. It's only my second year doing this. Actually, I've not even completed a year yet. So I'm pulling out chairs. I'm waving at young referees. Come on, guys, get a chair. Here, here you go. Take one. They're all looking at each other. Who's this guy? See them. I looked kind of official and old, so they kind of came up and took some chairs, and we set up tables, and we're like, let's put them back there, and I saw my buddy Sam, and Sam, come on up here, and you, he goes, did they put you in charge of this? I said, nah, this needs to be done, let's get it done, oh, okay, all right, and all of a sudden, he's working for me, you know, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, and then other people were coming in, I'm giving up my seat, here you go, take the chair, and people are like, what's going on here, but I'm thinking, you know, we're all one big family together, we got to get this done, it's, it, this is going to be a four-hour thing. We, you know, let's let's all be a part of it. Let's all get it done. Let's do it together. It's just this is a thing that's been prepared for you. And some guys would not sit down. I'm like, here's four chairs here. There's a table. Oh, it's okay. I'll, I'll stand. I see the one guy for four hours. <laughs> Who wants to stand for four hours? If they had a couch there, I'd be laying down on it. You know, like four hours. Dude, there's. I said, there's a table right there. And after the first break, finally they sat down. I thought, why would? Why wouldn't you sit down? It's prepared for you. It's ready for you. This is a beautiful thing that I don't understand. God has provided a way. Why wouldn't you come to him? Why wouldn't you today say, yeah, for sure I'm a sinner. No doubt. I need Jesus. I need him. That's what Romans is saying. It's right there for you. In Revelation 3, it says that Jesus, he's saying this to the church even. I'm standing at the door. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repentant. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking this is the heart of the Father through Christ. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus is saying, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. Will you let me in? If you hear my voice, he says, and you open the door, I'll come in and eat with you and you with me. And that one will be victorious. I'll give him the right to sit with me on my throne. This is the beautiful picture of the gospel. Today's the day to say yes. Now is the moment. And Jesus essentially is there. And I love this kind of picture of just... You're like, how did you get a picture of Jesus? Listen, it's, it's not. I found one of the guy who looks like him. But let's pretend together. Okay, there's Jesus knocking at the door. Wouldn't that be, a, that, wouldn't that be the greatest picture? You open the door and you're like, Jesus. I mean, that's, that to me, I don't understand. Why, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? We either have a, a heart of a younger son who comes and says, thank you, Father, for bringing me back in. Or we have a heart of an older son who's got his arms crossed and saying, no. I want to do it myself. I want it my own way. 
And we will miss out if we don't surrender to him. And that's why 1 Corinthians will finish with this verse this morning. It says, I want to remind you of the gospel preached to you, which you received, and which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. Look at this. Christ died for our sin, according to the scripture. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And he appeared to the twelve and to others. This is the gospel. It's simple. It means that it's provided for us a way of salvation. And one day, the reality is that Jesus is coming again for us. Sons, daughters, he's coming back for those who have said yes. And there will be a hand extended like this to those who have said yes. He is looking for those who today will, will welcome him, will say, I, I want to be part of what you're doing. I want to be part of this. And, and if we're going to be like that older one who will say, no, I, I want to accomplish it on my own, we are going to miss out on the greatest blessing there is, heaven with Jesus. Would you stand with me this morning as we wrap up our time together? I want to pray with you and those online who are watching and considering this morning what this means for you. Heavenly Father, we, as we look at the story of these two sons, and we see one son who is repentant, who runs to the father, who is restored and brought back into the family, we rejoice. And for many of us, that's been our story. We've come back to you, and we are grateful that you have made us a son again, undeserved, but you welcome us in. And for many more of us, we have tried to do it through good works and and by obeying commandments, and yet we have no relationship with you. And today I speak to those who are in that part of the field, so to speak, that today is a day of salvation to simply understand that God loves you and is inviting you to come in, to come into the party, come into the house, to celebrate, to rejoice, and have a place at the table. Salvation is provided for us. And today, Jesus, we confess you as our Lord and our Savior. And we thank you that as younger or older sons, we can find a place at the cross. I pray for those today who will make this decision for the first time, that God would encourage their hearts and that they would find a good church family and begin to grow in you and see all of the beautiful things that are provided for us as sons and daughters of yours. And that one day as you come again, we all together will find a place at your table with you, Father God. Thank you for your great love. We pray it in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. So listen as you go this morning. Uh, thank you for being a part of the family. Don't forget about the sign-up list. We would encourage you to sign up and be a part of what we're doing there. Serve in the field. Uh, and also, next Sunday, we won't be here. So if you come, you'll think it's the rapture. I don't know. But we won't be here. We'll be elsewhere. So please don't forget about that. God bless you. Have an incredible week. God bless. And I uh, hope to see you next Sunday. Bye now. Blessings.